The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Keith Dallas, editor of an ambitious new history project from Tomorrow's Publishing titled American Comic Book Chronicles, and Jason Sachs, author of the latest volume covering the 1970s. Stick around. Comic books in the 1970s? This is my decade, baby. I only wish this was Jeopardy and I was a contestant. Giant size man thing for the win, Alex. <laughs> So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, brought to you today by Amazon.com. When you visit MrMedia.com and click on any of the links to purchase books, music, movies, gift certificates, or anything else through our Amazon link, you support this free video podcast. Whenever you need something else from Amazon, please consider returning to MrMedia.com to order it. It doesn't cost you any extra, and we sure appreciate the support. And don't forget, MrMedia.com has more than 1,200 celebrity audio and video interviews archived on the site. That's hundreds upon hundreds of hours free entertainment. Subscribe for free on MrMedia.com, and you'll instantly get an email every time a new interview is posted. You can also watch and subscribe to the show on YouTube, Vimeo, Daily Motion, The Realm Network, and Frequency.com. And if you prefer to just listen, Mr. Media is also available for free on iTunes, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Blueberry, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, Podfeed.net, and Player FM. You can subscribe to any of those services and never miss another episode. Finally, you can interact with Mr. Media Interviews on all kinds of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and more. Friend or follow us, we'll friend or follow you back. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of guys who lost all hope in their lives when the fans of Central Jersey cr crumpled in 1978 in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. There is no amount of conversation in the interview that follows that will possibly satisfy a 1970s comic book fan like myself. Look, I have read and studied comics all the way back to the dawn of time, and there is no era that I personally enjoy more than the four color symphonies produced from about 1969 to 1978. Why? Well, in no particular order, Giant Size X-Men, Howard the Duck, Man-Thing, Nova, Thing vs. Hulk, Human Torch vs. Iceman, The Invaders, The Defenders, E-Man, Conan the Barbarian and Roy Thomas, Red Sonja and Frank, Th Frank Thorne, uh, Atlas Comics, George Perez, Steve Gerber, Neil Adams, and Dennis O'Neill, R. Crumb, Dennis Kitchen, and The Undergrounds, Frank Frazetta paintings. Uh, wait, there's more. Warren reprints of The Spirit, Green Lantern, Green Arrow drug stories, The Death of Gwen Stacy, Superman vs. Spider-Man, Superman vs. Muhammad Ali, Superman vs. Shazam, Star Wars, Command Eye, The Last Boy on Earth, Great Fantastic Four Adventures, Two Captain Marvels, Prez, Plop, Crazy, Black comics that weren't actually black but seemed it at the time, including Black Lois Lane and Black Green Lantern. How about subsequent black comics that were more black than that, including Black Panther, Luke Cage, Hero for Hire, Blade the Vampire Killer, Brother Voodoo, and even my friend Tony Isabella's Black Lightning. How about Steranko's History of Comics, the explosion of comics fandom as an industry, including the first Comic-Con, the first Overstreet Guide, and the development of a resale marketplace for original comic book pages, the Comic Book Buyer's Guide, and my friend Murray Bischoff. I was a teenager in the 70s, and I couldn't wait for the new comics to be delivered on Wednesdays to the Krauser's Dairy Store, a short bike ride from my house, or for the Bronsteins at Eldorado Comics to bring the latest issues to monthly fans of Central Jersey meetings at the North Brunswick, New Jersey Recreation Center. For these reasons, and many more, I'm like a pig in mud reading the latest installment of Tomorrow's Publishing's American Comic Book Chronicles, the 1970s, 
written by Jason Sachs and edited by Keith Dallas. I could get lost in the stories, pictures, and memories of this fantastic volume for days, maybe weeks, maybe months. I hope you'll consider buying a copy and doing the same. And i got to add, in the interest of full disclosure, I must mention that I have a uh, little title of my own coming out from tomorrow's publishing in 2015. But that had absolutely no influence on my decision to feature this particular book. All my best comics memories originate in the 70s, and that is the truth. Now, joining us today are Jason Sachs, who you can see, and Keith Dallas, who you cannot. But he is there. Say hello, Keith. Hello, everyone. I just asked you to say hello, Keith. Oh, oh, oh. All right. <laughs> uh, you know, folks, it's going to probably go downhill from there. Yeah. Anyway, Jason Sachs and Keith Dallas, welcome. And in your case, Keith, welcome back to Mr. Media. Yes, thanks for having me back. Thank you for having me. Good to have you here. Uh, guys, uh, tomorrow's will eventually cover all eras, so i got to ask, why the 1970s? Why now? And in particular, why you, Jason? <sighs> Well, the 70s is an era that I just have a deep passion for. When you were going through your uh, stories about the uh, comics that you adored from that decade, I was kind of mentally ticking them off myself. Yes, Black Panther. Yes, Superman versus Muhammad Ali. Yes, Luke Cage, Hero for Hire. They're all just treasured memories and stories of, from the 1970s that I just absolutely adore. Oh, yes. I remember distinctly buying that from the... Uh, Five and Dime in Cooperstown, New York in 1977 and trading um, that for, I think, several issues of Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes with a friend of mine. Um, it just goes back to kind of almost my DNA in a way, my passion for the 1970s. Uh, but more than that, um, Keith uh, was kind enough to have me be part of the uh, American Comic Book Chronicles, the 1980s book. I wrote two chapters for that book about 1985 and 86, and that was one of my favorite experiences of my life. I just really loved kind of digging in deep into those years and just um, learning and sharing my knowledge from those really important years in comics history. So when the uh, 1970s book opened up um, as part of Keith's overall project, which involves a number of different writers to write about different decades, um, I was delighted that he asked me to be part of this project, along with several other writers who I, I think Keith will want to mention as well. Um, and what it's turned out to be is a great way to celebrate my passion for the decade and share some of the great stories, but also kind of get a great overview of the, of the time. Uh, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that each of the different pieces of the decade are managed as individual components, but we have storylines moving through the decade, whether it's the uh, fall of underground comics or the rise and fall of Jack Kirby in the decade or the rise of the direct market or the way that the kind of auteur was seen in the comics industry in the 1970s. They all are part of a larger storyline that I think gets built as you read this book. It's certainly something that I kind of came away with uh, a different perception after having written the book. Uh, I've been a fan of this stuff literally from the day it came out, and yet I, I ended up learning just more in terms of a perspective on the decade than I'd ever imagined I would have. Hey, Keith, let me ask you, uh, as the, the, the man who's overseeing all of the volumes, which will eventually stretch from the 30s to the 90s, um, what sets, uh, maybe you have the perspective, what sets the 70s apart from any other decade? I, th I have my own ideas, but I'd like to know what you think. Uh, I think with the 70s, it, the 70s is the first decade where the uh, inmates began to run the asylum. Uh, where, you know, particularly with Marvel, where, where Marvel experienced such a dramatic growth in production. Um, that the editors in chief there, up until Shooter took over, uh, the editors in chief of Marvel really had no choice but to say, you know, to the writers, okay, you know, go do your thing. And then, so you had some really sort of passionate writing by, you know, people like uh, Don McGregor and Steve Englehart and Jim Starlin. Um, and, you know, and, and I think some people could argue that they, they took it too far, that they, they became, you know, particularly for a mainstream comic book publisher, uh, maybe too unorthodox or too 
you know, quote unquote, out there. But, um, and I think we're also we're also talking about in the seventies how the sell through rates begin to plummet to such a degree that the publishers really start to grasp at anything and everything to improve sales. So you have the relevancy period, you have, you know, uh, a rekindling of interest in horror, uh, you have the abandonment of, of or well, not the abandonment, but you have, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the comics code becomes revised to such a degree that uh, you can, you know, publishers felt they, they could start to get away with, with more things. Um, so uh, it, it was that to me was what was particularly interesting about researching the 1970s. And, and, and let me ask both of you guys: this. It seems it's like in the, in the 70s, 70s, it became a business not just to the companies that published the magazines, but slowly, finally, the creators were seeing it as a business, and not just you know. I get a check and then I move on to the next check. And suddenly they realize someone's making a ton, and that's a kind word, of money off of my work, and I'm not seeing enough of it. And and certainly we know by the 80s uh, we started seeing a lot lot of independent companies that were going their own way and creators' rights. But it seemed like seven, the 70s was really the beginning of that. Am, am I am I off here? Well, it's an interesting decade from that perspective because um, they're the fans who really were the first major wave of fans who became professionals. Um, people like the Friedrich Brothers, Jim Starlin, uh, Len Wein, uh, Marv Wolfman, uh, you can go on and on. Um, the, these were the first people who were true comics fans who came out of the fandom of the 1960s, and it was their biggest ambition in life to write for comics. Yeah, I think, um, I'm, and up to the, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jason, but you know, no, no. point, you know, particularly even to the early 60s, People were working in comic books as a sort of medium point, hoping to get to newspaper strips. You know, the, the real desire was to work in newspaper strips. And I think that's, you know, by the 70s, you know, like, like Jason saying, you have people who genuinely want to write, want to draw comic books, not because they want to, you know, buy their time until their newspaper strip idea takes off, but generally because they, they, they have a genuine love for the comic book. And the characters as well. Yeah. And so you have you have people like Jerry Conway entering the industry at I believe nineteen, Len Wein and Marv Wolfman in their early twenties, and they're quickly thrust upon the most popular titles in the line, in part because they really want to write them and they have a tremendous affinity for them, um, and they were really given all the work that they could get. I believe there's one month where Conway writes one third of all the books that Marvel puts out. Um. At, at the same time, though, there were two other kind of side movements. One is that um, spearheaded uh, in large part by Neil Adams, there was a drive for what they call the Creators Guild, which is an attempt to create a union for comic creators that would allow uh, them to negotiate in, in collective bargaining, uh, get major medical and other insurance type benefits, and kind of allow themselves to really not be uh, screwed over by the publishers who had shown kind of a bad faith in some ways. Um, one of the things we can talk about is how they went to the Philippines and recruited a whole slew of wonderful Filipino artists who worked at a fraction of what the American artists worked at. So while all this is going on then too, um, both Marvel and DC, which by mid seventies were owned by large conglomerates, uh, Marvel by a company called cadence industries and DC, by uh, Warner Communications, we're losing a tremendous amount of money. Um, both of them have lost some, somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 million in 1976 to 77. And there was some question about whether the industry would actually survive. Um, and it was really only because of two causes that, that the comics industry even got out of the 1970s. In Marvel's case, it was the fact that Roy Thomas secured an adaptation of Star Wars, the most popular movie uh, to that time, for free, and Marvel sold sold over a million copies of the Star Wars adaptation, uh, uh, um, basically for free. And DC with uh, Superman the movie, which had created some some heat around the intellectual property. So it was, um, despite the labor movement, despite the people who were anxious to get into comics, there was a tremendous sense of dread 
um, from about 76 to the early years of the Jim Shooter reign at Marvel, where there was just a sense the comics could be dying. And that alone is a great narrative. I mean, something like Superman, which sold in the neighborhood of a half million copies in 1970, was selling somewhere in the neighborhood of 80,000 copies by 1979. Interesting, too, that uh, as you mentioned that, I was thinking, yeah, in the 70s, you had the Superman movie, and, and the DC comic character electrified uh, the movies, and, and uh, uh, Marvel's characters were on TV, the, the, the Hulk on sure. CBS Spider-Man. and Spider-Man on CBS, yes. and now, of course, it's completely reversed, whereas you know, right. uh, D- mm-hmm. DC can barely you know, uh, attract people to the movies, and, but they own TV, and Marvel completely owns uh, the movies. Uh, right. So, yeah, it's just uh, it's interesting. Did the, did the movies and TV in the 70s, did that affect creators' rights as they were drawing attention to, oh, Superman, oh, wait a minute, who created Superman? Did, did, uh, did they, are they getting any money from this? I think that was you want to tell the best. story of Siegel yeah. and Schuster? Yeah, with the Siegel and Schuster, particularly, you know, once Jerry Siegel found out that you know there was going to be a um, a, a Superman movie, and how the producers, you know, the uh, you know the uh, the Salkinds were spending a lot, a lot of money on on just about every facet of. The movie, but particularly with cast, you know, with securing Marlon Brando and securing Gene Hackman, but also securing Mario Puzo. Um, And so even before the camera starts rolling, uh, the the Salkinds have spent a considerable amount of money. And that, you know, Jerry Siegel just lost his mind over that fact. And... Uh, you know, credit to Neil Adams who took Siegel and Schuster's cause, you know, upon his shoulders and got the media attention to their plight. Because by the by the mid seventies, I mean they were they were destitute. You know, uh, Schuster was oh, was it so? Uh, Siegel was a was a help me out, Jason. Siegel was was a typist, I think, or like a clerk. And Schuster was was practically blind. I think he was working as a security guard. Something like that. I'd have to, yeah. Uh, and he was drawing bondage art, as we've since learned. That, that I was a bit that, earlier. Oh, is that earlier? Okay. Never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> because really, at, by that time, the, both men were just beaten down by life. Um, Siegel worked for... Uh, worked for DC in the 1960s under um, the tyrannical uh, Mort Weisinger, um, which may have also had a role in breaking his soul. But anyway, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and um, Adams took their cause on and did a tremendous publicity tour that got placement in the popular newspapers of the time, um, talking about how millions of dollars were being paid for the for Superman the movie, and yet these men were making virtually nothing. They were living in poverty. Even got them appearance an appearance on the Today Show around the holiday season, I believe, in 1977, um, which gave a lot of attention to to uh, the story of Siegel and Schuster. Um, and he was able to negotiate a reasonable settlement. Um, I believe it was twenty thousand dollars a year in so 1970. Was, uh, you know, was was a livable. I mean, a livable salary. Oh, sure. Right. Right. And there's some question whether it was 20 or a slightly larger amount. But regardless, it was, it was a, um, there was an annuity that would be paid to the family, which has subsequently been renewed at larger numbers as well. Yeah. And also they provided their credit for Siegel and Schuster and all Superman comics. So it's a, a great case of uh, good triumphing over evil in the comic industry. But it was a limited case in that, uh, for example, Jack Kirby left Mar. Jack, I mean, Jack Kirby, who co-created most – Many, if not most, of the big Marvel hits of the the '60s with uh, uh, Stan Lee uh, got credit, but never got any money, and ultimately right. left Marvel uh, over that. And we witnessed one of the one of the big trends of the uh, of, of the first part of the '70s, which was Kirby's here, the Kirby explosion, the you know right. the worlds of Kirby. Um, and I, I bring this up because, and I want to quote this. This is a great line in uh, Jason's introduction. Uh, you say uh, uh, that among your friends, quote, we agreed that Jack Kirby was a hack. And, <laughs> and I would say that me, me and my friends in that time 
thought pretty much the same thing. Of course, you know, your kids, uh, you're about six years younger than me, I think, um, and all you see is what's in front of you. You don't know the history, a lot of which came out much later. And my feeling was, oh, my God, Kirby's producing like six books a week. Uh, mm-hmm. They all look alike. They're not very interesting. Uh, with the ex- I did like uh, Command I, The Last Boy on Earth. I thought that was clever. But, uh, and, you know, I, relatively speaking, you could make a case for, I don't know, Mr. Miracle and things. But, um, yeah, it just, it was not, it, it just looked like he was just a complete factory, just pumping out one thing after the other, after the other. And, but in retrospect, I think uh, that a lot of that had to do with he had made no money. He had no savings. He, he had nothing to live on and support his support his family. Uh, Stan was running the company, getting a good salary and, and, and possibly, probably participating in the profits from things that other people created. Uh, Jack had nothing, so he got the opportunity right with DC to suddenly start pumping out a ton of material, get paid for it. Plus, he was probably getting his art back for the first time, and maybe he got to sell that, uh, earn additional money. And that's why we were subjected to this just flood of uh, inferior Kirby work. Well, I think he still Kirby still wasn't getting his artwork back until until the threat of Atlas, uh, because that's when when Atlas came. Uh, uh, right, Jason. Uh, it's, uh, make, correct me if right. I'm wrong. Yeah, it's it was the threat of Atlas because Atlas was you know, I mean it, it was Goodman's Martin Goodman's uh, new baby, uh, who you know he. He devised with his son, as for many many people believe, to just sort of get even with Marvel. But in the process of getting even with Marvel, he was also poaching uh, DC talent. And as a uh, countermeasure, Carmine Infantino had to institute some some radical measures, at least at that point, including. Uh, Getting you know royalties on reprints, getting the original artwork back. The page rates were raised because he he saw that his talent was walking across the street, not to Marvel, but to this new Atlas outfit. Um, yeah, and so Jack profited from that, although he didn't do any work for Atlas because he was on an right. exclusive contract with DC at the time. Atlas Comics, home of Iron Jaw, Planet of the Vampires. Um, help me out here. What else? Um, oh, the, Dest- boy. the Destructor, Tiger Man. Yeah, two. Those uh, are two of the worst, by the way. Destructor <laughs> and Tiger Man. Just, Actually, the first issue of Destructor is an underrated uh, quality book. It's written first by. Issue, then it completely changed. Right. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. It's written by Archie Goodwin, penciled by Steve Ditko, and inked by Wally Wood. It's a it's a quality comic. The the book kind of falls off into the pits of um, terribleness after that. But um, no, I mean Grim a- Atlas, which uh, my my favorite Grim line about Atlas is the um, comic book artist uh, magazine did a cover feature on it, and they called it Vengeance Incorporated. Yeah, yeah, that's a great. And I, I always thought that's a perfect name for it. Yeah. I love those books. I was I was so excited when they had a brief revival uh, a couple of three years ago, it, but of course it went nowhere. But uh, that was that was some fun titles. I, I yeah, that. Planet of the Vampires. Can yes. you imagine? Yes. And I think you know they had set up set it up well, uh, but then Martin Goodman sort of stuck his nose into it and and sort of began to make these very arbitrary creative decisions that essentially drove the talent away from Atlas. Uh, and, you know. Kind of let you know that it was Stan Lee making the creative decisions at Marvel, not uh, Martin Goodman. Right. He kept trying to copy the Marvel titles as much as yeah. possible to the point where he, even the cover banner had the Atlas logo, which rep- which is really similar to the Marvel com- book, comic book, group logo and other things and it just kind of all spun out into be this giant fiasco but there's a number of wonderful comics that they put out uh, thankfully they're still all available in the quarter bin um <laughs> they also never got distribution though and that um the uh, independent distributors who were responsible for d- putting out the comics, it was uh, essentially a payola system. It was pay for play. You're yeah. expected to give them some money in order to get new span- uh, rack space. And um, the guys who ran Atlas just weren't able to do that in the same way, especially that a Warner could, book could. 
And uh, we have um, comments from a man named Russ Maharis, who lived in Chicago and worked at um, the distribution house there in the 1970s. They said they had stacks and stacks and stacks of Atlas comics just sitting in the back that they just would never distribute. They said that they distributed something like 15% of all Atlas books that came through their warehouse. And it's Russ, else. Even, Russ said that Atlas had even worse distri distribution than um, Charlton, you know. Yeah, so that that's saying something. Famously, the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, right. All right, so right. let me let me let me change gears a little bit. I, I'd like each of you to tell us perhaps a favorite writer, artist, and or series from the seventies. It could be more than one if you can't you know if, if you can't come to one. But Jason, you want to go first? Yeah, let's let well, Jason go first. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly rants about a few of these favorites uh, more than once. Um, uh, I, so uh, the comics that kind of bent my brain the most, uh, so uh, as you mentioned, Bob, I was born in 1966, so um, I uh, really kind of came of age reading comics, and some of my first memories are of comics in my hands. And um, about the time I reached uh, my early teen years, uh, the hottest writer in comics was Steve Gerber. Gerber was an idea machine, another person like Jerry Conway who wrote many, many comics every month. There's some months in 75, 76, and 77 when he wrote five or six books per month. And um, uh, he was very quickly my favorite writer, in part because he was so different from everybody else, where everyone is pre presenting a kind of homogenized view of American happiness. Um, Gerber was presenting these kind of very disturbed looks at the world. He was a troubled man that came out in this comic art. And because he was successful and because he met his deadlines, uh, he could just continue to, to create his work. Uh, Roy Thomas and his successor just gave him that freedom. Um, so my favorite run of comics from the 1970s, it's a little bit of a hard choice, but uh, for the sake of this conversation, anyway, I'm going to pick Steve Gerber's run on The Defenders. Oh, excellent. Oh, wow. Good choice. Um, Shock so the Defenders were, were... It didn't come out of Jason's mouth there. What's that? Sorry, Kate? I'm shocked the words Don McGregor didn't come out of your mouth. <laughs> well, if, you, if we were talking tomorrow, I might talk about Panther's Rage. <laughs> Starring the Black Panther or, um, or Kill Raven, Warrior of the World, or Omega the Unknown, another great Gerber creation. Oh, great. But the Defenders were uh, this kind of loose amalgamation of second-rate superheroes. There was Nighthawk, who was a ripoff of, of um, Batman. There was the Hulk... Uh, Doctor Strange, the Valkyrie, who was kind of this no one kind of hero heroine, and um, there's a wonderful ten part storyline in which basically all the heroes go through great scenes of existential doubt. In the first chapter, uh, Nighthawk, who like Bruce Wayne is a uh, rich millionaire, rich millionaire, he's a millionaire in his everyday life. Um, just goes through this tremendous existential crisis and ends up waking up and with his mind and the body of a deer. <laughs> From there, the story just goes off in all kinds of unexpected directions. It becomes a satire of the 1970s self-help movement and a story about self-actualization. And there's a prison drama in the middle of it. And it just goes uh, all kinds of wild and crazy uh, places that you just would never expect. And yet the story kind of all holds together, too. And so it's this kind of, in a way, very archetypical 1970s story where it has these kind of core Marvel characters, you know, the Hulk and Doctor Strange, and they're having adventures. And a lot of kind of standard Marvel her uh, villains show up in there. You know, there, there's the Porcupine and the Plant Man show up <laughs> at one point. Um, and they have a battle in New York, and that, that's all well and good. But at the same time, it's also a lot more than that. It's uh, this kind of very satirical existential drama that seems improvised and loose. And it's a clear case of, you know, Gerber just throwing anything on the page and Marvel just saying, we'll release this. And so in a lot of ways, it's just this very kind of classic 1970s to me. Okay, and that, now, now, wait, before, before, and before we, we, we skip over to Keith, I have to point something out. And I think this is the age difference between us, uh, Jason, uh, the six years difference. Uh, you skipped right over the Valkyrie very quickly. I got to point out to you that to someone who was six years older than you picking up that comic, <laughs> the Valkyrie... Uh, with her blonde hair, her enormous uh, uh, breasts uh, stuffed into conical uh, bras, 
uh, I, there was a reason she was in that book. I mean, it was, <laughs> you, you, you know, you, you, those of us in our teens dealing with puberty and stuff, we wanted to see more and more of her. And it was like, yeah, okay, Dr. Savage, Doc Savage, what, I mean, uh, Dr. Strange, you know, but uh, the Valkyrie, okay, now you got my attention, Steve. So I just want to point that out. Okay. Keith? Okay, I'm not saying that my dream girl is an Amazon who's about six two with her hair over one eye too, which is always my favorite part of her. One thing that now I'm a little bit younger than than you guys. I think you know I was uh, I was born in 1969, so the 70s is you know as a collector I I have more connection to the late 70s comic books than obviously the early 70s comic books, but, you know, researching the 70s comic book era, I would, one thing that really struck me, let's see, all right, let me, let me back up a second. I don't know if you guys ever encountered uh, people, comic book fans in their 20s who read Watchmen and they go, I don't see what the big deal is. And I have to explain to them, okay, okay, well, you're taking Watchmen out of its context and you're not understanding what what a radical departure Watchmen was from typical comic books and, and typical superhero comic books in 1986 and 1987. And that for someone encountering Watchmen in 2014, yeah, it might not seem as so avant-garde or, or unconventional because of what has happened, what has been published since Watchmen. And that, you know, I throw out that example to sort of describe 1970s comic books that, you know, some of these, some of these writers and artists that we, you know, put up on a mantle that emerge in the 1970s, you might look at them and say, well, I, I really don't see what the big deal is about Steve Englehart, or I really don't see what the big deal is about Dave Cockrum art. And the big deal is, is that in that time, in that context, they were, they were doing things that they really didn't have to do. You know, that this is, again, an era where creators weren't paid royalties. If their comic book sold 300,000 copies, they were getting paid the same rate as if the comic book sold 80,000 copies. So create, it was, there was no incentive to be creative. There was no incentive to, to put in extra work. So what, so I became struck with the creators who actually did more work than they needed to do like John Byrne, like Dave Cockrum, uh, or, or were, you know, think about how many, uh, how many artists were just trying to be uh, Neil Adams knockoffs, you know. So then you have an artist like Marshall Rogers, mm. who, whose style is you know, completely different than, than anything that, had been, that, that was being published at that time. So... Um, or, or, yeah, again, I'll come back to Steve Englehart. If, if, if I had to choose a favorite 1970s comic book writer, I would say Steve Englehart because, uh, and, and he, he's someone that I really didn't respect when I was reading comic books in the 1980s because I didn't, I thought he was wordy, I thought, you know, he was way out there, but, but as I researched, you know, the, the 1970s for this book, that's when I really became to respect, like, oh, wow, you know, he's, he's, and, you know, he's a pacifist, you know, he's a, he was a, um, um, Conscientious uh, subjector. Thank you, yes, uh, for the Vietnam War, so, so, coming from, from that perspective, what, the, the stuff that he was doing in Avengers, and then in Justice League, and, and Detective, was, I, you know, I'll, I'll use the word groundbreaking, you know, so, I would choose Engelhardt as, as an author, and, um, Marshall Rogers as an artist. And I'm glad you, you mentioned Vietnam. I, I wanted to bring that up. Uh, uh, now, I'm, I would have been uh, 13, 14 years old uh, when it was announced that we were pulling out of Vietnam and that was the end of that. You guys were a little young for, 
for having firsthand knowledge of, of that. But uh, was it? And I, I mean, the thing that struck me was, oh my God, I will not be drafted and sent to Vietnam. <laughs> I mean, it was important to me at the time. Right. Because I, you know, you, you everyone of a certain age knew someone who had been sent or had gone to Canada or was fighting with con, uh, conscientious subjector status, that kind of thing. So it was important, and I wondered if you had a sense after putting together this book on the seventies, did Vietnam affect uh, comic books uh, in that era, both? Uh, at the beginning of the, the decade when the war was raging and then as we got to the middle as the war was winding down and it was it was less emph- uh, less emphasized I guess well I think it's addressed in two different ways um, first of we, we do cover the undergrounds of the 1970s especially in the early chapters and there's such a strong component of not necessarily anti-war comics it's a, it's a little surprising how little anti-war comics there were at the time, um, but more of the kind of hippie attitude towards the world, um, you know, the praise for drugs and loose sex and um, the kind of rebellion against society that uh, Zap Comics represented uh, and many other underground cartoonists followed. Um, in the big boom of underground publishing in, in the early 70s, there were some anti-war comics, but there were just as many books that were like Abortion Eve that are about uh, the legalization of abortion and what it means for women. Uh, more, so it's more kind of an openness in, in the um, in the comic world. Uh, when it comes to mainstream comics, also, the, Vietnam was a topic that really they stayed away from as much as anything. There's some issues of Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos where they return to Vietnam and fight, but they're kind of awkward stories that don't quite work really on any level. There's a Spider-Man story where he goes to Vietnam. I think that's from the late 60s. Um, also not a great comic. Uh, Flash Thompson, um, uh, Peter Parker's friend, is, uh, joins the military for a few years. Um, more than that, though, I think the comics really fit the mood of the time, which was, especially by the middle of the decade, just kind of a sense of American loss, American despair. Um, The comics, even of 1970 and 71, uh, on the mainstream side, versus 74, 75, 76, are a lot, uh, there's a big difference. The the mid-70s just have this feeling of bleakness to them. Uh, We were fighting the multiple threats of uh, Watergate, the oil crisis, rising crime, the impact of the return from Vietnam, inflation, they're all kind of hitting the country at one time. And so I think uh, the Vietnam War, at least in my perception, was just one of many things that kind of led to this kind of strange era in American history where the American optimism was really down. And so from that, we saw a lot of a rise of anti-heroes like Wolverine, Deathlock the Demolisher, uh, Michael Fleischer's Dark Vision of the Spectre, uh, and so on. The, Nomad. The Punisher. Nomad. And Nomad, too, who was, um, of course, um, the original vision of Nomad was that uh, Captain America witnesses uh, President Nixon commit suicide in the Oval Office. He is the leader of an evil empire. Um which causes him to go through existential doubt, hang up the uh, shield, and wander America as the nomad. Um, in a very interesting storyline that, that's both the good and the bad of the 1970s, I think. Um, and that's a, just another aspect of kind of this feeling of drift that our country was in during that era. Jason has the perfect title for the 1974 chapter, and that is No More Heroes. And I think that's, you know, what your question sort of leads to that premise that Vietnam becomes one of many, uh, you know, many things going on politically, socially, uh, that just impacts the the American consciousness. And, uh, you know, like Jason perfectly said, it was, you know, a a sense of malaise, a sense of, of despair, um, certainly in, in stark contrast to, you'd say, what was going on in the mid-80s, where you had this, you know, renewed sense of nationalism. Um, and, and the publishers, particularly 1974, I think, the 1974 chapter really, really gets into how the overall national uh, despair how the creators tap into that 
the Spectre, you know, the, the, the revival of the Spectre in DC at DC Comics certainly taps into that. Um, even a character like um, Archie Goodwin and Walt Simonson's Manhunter, I mm-hmm. think, you know, he, he's a bit of an anti-hero. You know, the, the rise of the anti-heroes uh, in 1974 and then how a few years, oh, even a couple years later, we got a great quote from Elliot S. Magan who in, yeah. was it 75 or 76, Jason? I'm trying to remember. That's a, it, that's a wonderful essay he writes about no more heroes, right? Well, yeah, and, and how he feels that, you know, um, you know how, how the American public, at, uh, you know, after a certain amount of time, he felt the American public was ready for the, he- the return of the hero. Um, and in and, fact, that's a big reason why Star Wars was such a massive hit, is that that's people were just desperate for, for this kind of mythological happiness. You have to remember, in 74, the biggest pop culture um, things were... Uh, the number one TV show was All No Family, which was about conflict. The number one movie was The Godfather, which had tremendous social in, uh, influence, but it's a very kind of dark vision of America. And horror films were big, The Exorcist and The Omen. Um, you know, they kind of represent a lot of the darkness in the, our country. And so uh, something like Star Wars is kind of transformative in a way because it was like, thank goodness we have someone we can cheer for. You know, I'm Luke Skywalker. I'm here to help. I want to make uh, two foot- footnotes to the preceding conversation. One is that I, I realized, uh, as Jason was talking about Captain America and Nomad, that in my introduction I, I neglected to mention the Falcon, who I thought was a very cool character, yeah. also black. And uh, while uh, uh, Keith was talking about uh, uh, Elliot uh, uh, Smagin, uh, I believe it's supposed to be Elliot S. Exclamation point. <laughs> right? Right. Yes. Yeah. Now, I, I'll I, at the you know in the eighties, I lived at I lived in a in a part of Long Island where he ran for office. He was he was oh, running for yeah he was running for uh, uh, I think it was state assemblyman. Hmm. I don't and he didn't win, but you know, I, but I would see I would see signs. I'm like wait a minute, that's a guy that's a guy who writes Superman. <laughs> Do they have an S with an exclamation mark? No, that no, it didn't. <laughs> uh, it's too bad. It might have helped. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Keith, I, I just had a curiosity. Do you keep mentioning the, the specter because in this conversation you are unseen? Yes. Uh, having an influence? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to be the avenging ghost depending, you know, how this, how this uh, whole conversation ends. This, and we should probably mention Dead Man too, right? Because he, he, uh, he rose up in the 70s. He was created, I think, in the 60s, but he, he oh, yeah. rose up in the 70s. Um, so uh, let's change the conversation slightly um, in terms of the, the, the book, this particular book and the series themselves. Keith, when you were on with me before, I think the book we dealt with was the, uh, the first half of the 60s uh, in the uh, American Comic Book Chronicle. Uh, and probably the 80s as well, yes? No? No, I don't think, we 60s, got, I don't think the 80s no. was out quite yet. So I think it was okay. the 60s. So um, I wanted to ask you for people who may just be joining us and uh, haven't heard this, um, the, the books are... It's not just a collection of uh, stories and text with comic book covers. You reproduce and you've chosen a lot of uh, uh, there's uh, art from uh, like in-house ads. Yeah. There's uh, logos. There's other things. Um, can you talk a little bit about the philosophy in terms of the art that accompanies the text about uh, this particular decade? And what kind of what were some of the better finds for you? Oh. Some of the better finds, you know, it's, I mean, on one hand, it was easier with the 80s book because, you know, like saying getting photographs of people were a little bit easier. Um, as, you, as you start to get it, you know, in the 70s and particularly in the 60s, you know, just the, the quality of the scans are going to be uh, a challenge, you know, because they say what you're scanning, the... Um, yeah, there's one piece in particular. Um, Jim Steranko was attached for a while to write, or write and draw the um, the shadow. And there's a gorgeous illustration we found online that Steranko had done for uh, his presentation for the book, but we couldn't get a high enough resolution scan of the image. Yeah, you know, I mean, we 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 encountered that, you know, or uh, you know, Jason and I obviously have our individual collections, and we would we would deliberately duplicate scans. And let um, David, our designer, choose the scan that he felt was of the higher quality because you know it's just because of the 
how how newsprint degrades over what now it's you know forty years. You know, forty years, yeah. You know, when you think about it, um, you know. But you're right. I mean, I mean, the overall philosophy for American Comic Chronicles is not not only just to provide the sort of iconic covers or the iconic uh, comic panels, but also to give. Um, you know, readers a feel of, you know, what a house ad looked like from the, the 60s and 70s. Because those are the things, you know, if, if people are just buying trade paperbacks, if they're not, you know, going out and buying the original issues. And, and heck, if you're going back to the 70s, you know, trying to buy that stuff is, is expensive. I mean, I've, I've been trying to buy uh, Frontline Comics and Two-Fisted Tales from mm-hmm. EC Comics, and the only ones I could afford are like you know falling apart. But it, you know, to, to try as much as possible to give the readers a feel of well, you know, here's what a letter column, you know, uh, not that we provide that many, but you know, uh, and I did that with my you know with my previous uh, tomorrow's publishing book, The Flash Companion, was also to you know to try to to show the house ads because the, the trade paperbacks they don't include the house ads, and I think the house ads are really, you know, a treasure. And I think it gives kind of a a 360-degree view of the decade. You know, we're not just telling the familiar stories or showing the familiar covers. Um, One of the... uh, I just love pulling out the more obscure stories and pulling out the more obscure uh, books. You know, we we reprint the cover of Real Pulp Comics from 1971 in in our book. Uh, There's there's, uh, Skywall's short live... um, uh, comics line from 1971 we have coverage from that as well because it's all part of the larger narrative um that's the thing is the the, the american comic chronicles one of our kind of core goals and uh, tell me if i'm overstating this at all keith is to give people a real view of what it was like kind of on the ground at the time when these are happening this isn't a history that's written by the winners so to speak yeah. uh, we, we we tell the story of you know the death of gwen stacy and uh, how Marvel got star- the rights to Star Wars and all the other important stories that need to be told. But we also take took a lot of pride in telling some of the the uh, t- mentioning some of the more subtle stories from the decade too, the things that people might overlook. Um, talk about the the fall of romance comics, for example, or spend a reasonable amount of time talking about Charlton comics because they're all part of the larger scene at the time. There's a great cover you reproduced, and I, I read it out loud this afternoon to my to my wife across the room. She didn't find it as amusing as I did, but it was... I know it. I already know what you're going to say, and it's one of my <laughs> all-time favorite covers, but go ahead. No, go ahead. See, let's, let's hear it. Tell me what I was going to say. It's, um, uh, last week, I was dry humping... I yes, was dry yes, humping yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Completely. That, it was the cover of Young Lust Number One, and yes. you have the guy and the girl, and she's got the thought balloon, and she's saying, "Last week he was dry humping me in the hallway, and this week he doesn't even remember my name." Yes, <laughs> one of my all-time. Oh my god! Comics. Now you got me looking over and looking through the book so I can show. There it is. <laughs> uh, can you? Yeah, hold. Yeah, this is good. Uh, that's it. That was something Jason. I said to Jason. I said we have to include this. Have Absolutely. to have to include this. Absolutely. Because I mean, the, the 1970s volume uh, of all the of all the volumes that have come out, it has the most words. Um, so nearly 200,000. We yeah, we ran into a situation where you know we we went over the page limit and we said okay, so now we had to start removing images. And I was adamant. I was like, "No, that is staying. That is." And you know, I crossed my fingers that that John Morrow wouldn't find that too racy or too. Because um, you know, I mean, he he is marketing this to libraries and and such. So, and he didn't object. You know, <laughs> so I'm like, "Oh, thank you." Now, the interesting thing, Bob, is um, and Jason, I don't know if you were with me when I saw the the original art at. Not not this past San Diego, but last year's San Diego, San Diego Comic Con 2013, Heritage Auctions had the original art to ah. that. And Dry Hump was whited out. You could tell that there was a word yes. whited out. And, and Dry Humping was written over it. So you can so you can tell from the, the word balloon, right? I'm holding it back up to the camera. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, use your imagination on what word was replaced. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, because you could get away with that in the undergrounds because sure. they, they were sold in uh, head shops such as my favorite, Weird Harold's in Milltown, New Jersey, and New Hope, Pennsylvania. Not that I've been in those places. Oh, <laughs> I don't, I've just heard of them through the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can so tell just you exactly to point out the diversity of the images we have, on the opposite page is a feminist comic, it ain't me, babe, and the cover of Slow Death number one. As you can see, they're kind of an interesting contrast to each other. Now, I can't Flip back to the previous pages, and we have a uh, beautifully beat-up copy of the Overstreet oh, Price yeah. Guide and um, a horror story, one of Bernie Wrightson's earliest comic book horror stories. Oh, Bernie Wrightson. So um, talent. We, we, cover, we cover a lot of ground in these chapters, as, as well as the obvious Conan number one. Mm-hmm. And so, um, uh, just uh, go ahead, Jason. Well, guys, I was going to ask you. I can't remember now. Uh, do you have any? Re- is there reference in there to uh, something that just I-, I waited by the mailbox for periodically? The uh, Friends of Old Marvel uh, newsletter. Yes. Uh, Foom. Was yep. that Okay, I must. I must. Just... I mean, we don't. We don't go into the the history of that, but we it does get mentioned because you know there were certain announcements in Foom. Um. So I mean we we don't get because I think that didn't that start in sixty nine? I think it was a little bit later than that. I was think. it maybe in seventy one or seventy two that yeah. it started? Stryka was the the force behind it. It's one of those cases where we only had so many words, Bob. I know. Yeah. Uh, I I I just tell you though, as a kid, then I when they first announced it, boy, I joined that so fast, and I would just wait by the mailbox <laughs> for it. And I was so yeah. frustrated. But you know, it's funny. It's kind of like I and. Uh, Keith, you probably didn't see this, but I, I held up, uh, I have the, the DVD set of the first season of uh, the Wonder Woman TV series from the 70s, Okay. and I got that just about a month ago. I saw it in a, a used uh, uh, record store, and uh, I imagine that Foom magazine is probably like this, in that I remember it as being a lot more fun and entertaining than it really was. <laughs> <laughs> no, i got to tell you, it's actually really wonderful to read those now. There's this this kind of energy in that magazine, I think in part because the guys who put it together just love comics so much that uh, it still kind of stands up in a way. Uh, I have a similar story to yours. I had a friend who had gotten the Foo membership packet and had that poster up on his wall, Mm -hmm. the Jim Steranko poster of all the Marvel characters. I saw that, and my first reaction is, Monday morning, my dad's going to write me a check so I can sign up, too. i got to do this. <laughs> it was great. It was such fun. Um, well, listen, uh, we've, we've, we've had you guys here for quite a while. And uh, before we wrap up, I just want to see, um, uh, Jason, let's start with you. You're doing the 90s now. You're finishing the 90s. Is that right? I am working on the American Comic Book Chronicles of the 1990s. Yeah, I'm deep into research and first draft writing of it. Um, a very different decade. Uh, uh, hoping to get it done in time to have it available at San Diego this year or next year. We'll see if it actually is able to be done by then. But um, yeah, it's a wonderful challenge. Uh, uh, it's a complicated, interesting, fascinating decade. Very good. Which I suppose you could say about any of our decades. <laughs> yes. Probably. Yes. Probably. And Keith, uh, as, a, as the guy who's overseeing the entire collection, uh, anything you want to tell us about what else is coming up? Well, we still have uh, Roy Thomas scheduled to write the... It's going to be two volumes on the 1940s, and he should get started on that uh, early in 2015. He had to finish uh, a few projects. He had to get a, a few projects out of the way before he uh, tackled it. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, as you mentioned, there there is going to be a uh, 1930s uh, volume written by Bob Hughes. We don't know yet the page length um, for that volume, but um, that will be you know the last volume uh, that we publish in this series. So it'll be Jason's 1990s volume followed by Roy's. Uh, two volumes in the 1940s, and then a volume in the 1930s, and and then we'll we'll see where we are with uh, with all the various print runs. Very good. I want to make a point of, of calling out that the 1980s book was not a uh, 1970s book rather was not solely written by me. Um, I have my book open so I can make sure not to miss anybody. I want to make sure to give credit to uh, our friends Jim Beard, Dave Dykema, and John Wells for. Uh, doing yeoman's work, uh, John in particular, 
yeah. just did just came up with things that we would have never thought of that gave the book just a much broader uh, perspective. He has some wonderful stuff that he brought us on Archie Comics, for example, that I think just adds such a level of perspective to the piece. John's the glue. John's the glue that's hold this whole thing together. Because you can you can ask John any you know question, and he'll he'll provide the answer. You know, or or he'll at least you know point you to what you need to read. And also, um, he helps you. I mean, you know, as Jason can attest, there there are times, there were times during the production of the 1970s volume where we're like, well, wait a minute, well, why did this happen? Like, um, Modern Comics, which was reprinting Charlton Comics. Hmm. And we're all like, and this is 1977, 1977. And we're all, you know, Dave Dykema, Jason and I are all scratching our head like, well, why did that happen? Like, why did, why did suddenly you get these Charlton reprints? And we would go, hey, John, can you, can you shed a light? And then suddenly we get this, like, five-page email about the story behind modern comics. And it's just, I mean, that, 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 that stuff that just, you know, speaking for myself, just, you know, made my day. Where I was just like, wow, because it's only like all the puzzle pieces just get put together, and you're like, wow, that's <laughs> mm-hmm. unreal. Well, um, uh, throughout the show, I've been holding up uh, some art that I've been finding. I haven't necessarily been referencing all of it, but uh, I've, I, I went and dug up some stuff of my own. I've got one more piece of art I want to show, and then we're going to say goodbye to our guests. This is the cover of Superman versus Spider-Man. It was a uh, big treasury comic. There they are, high above, who knows what. Never uh, heard of it. Never heard of it. Mm. The, the Those guys the are, are, who are the characters? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this was so awesome, uh, having you know been there when this came out. This was so exciting when it came out. Uh, it's still kind of fun to go back and read, uh, I will admit. But uh, I just wanted to show that. That was the last one I had to show. Um, so, folks, listen, uh, you can find... Okay. Uh, I'll make one more comment. Uh, uh, through d- December 1st, all of uh, tomorrow's books are on sale for half price on their website. So our book is, I believe, forty one ninety nine. You can pick it up for $21, and you can get a digital edition of it as well in PDF form. Um, so pop over to tomorrows.com, and you'll get a good bargain. Uh, as Keith said, it's a full-color, oversized, 288-page book. So even if you're just concerned for value for your dollar, I think you'll uh, get your money's worth. You're not going to get a cheaper price than that. No. Well, of course, no. now you're killing me because I was just about to say what I say at the end of every show, which is, uh, folks, you can find American Comic Book Chronicles <laughs> the 1970s uh, in great bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price <clears throat> here at MrMedia.com. Uh, if, if you're watching on MrMedia.com, you know that right below the video image, either over there or over there, uh, is the cover of the book. You can click on it. It'll take you right to uh, Amazon, where it will not be as cheap as it is on sale uh, through December 1st, 2014. But, of course, you'll be watching this show in 2020, and you'll be looking for the book, and Amazon will still be the best. Click there. Click there. Click it and buy the book. I think we all knew that this this interview was going to end badly, didn't we? (laughs) (laughs) Take the money out of Bob's family. (laughs) (laughs) Says the disembodied voice. Okay. Okay. so anyway, you can, you can click on you can click on the image down there, uh, and uh, Amazon will send you the book in thirty minutes or less uh, via uh, drone, or you can get it the via drone, yeah. through two day mail. Or uh, there is an e version; you can uh, have it electronically in seconds. Uh, guys, is there a website for the book or for either of you that you want to plug? There's a Facebook group, and the joy of the Facebook group, uh, if you. If, and who isn't on Facebook now? But uh, if you it, on Facebook, if you search for American Comic Book Chronicles, uh, please like it. And on a daily basis, we give you these nuggets of comic book history. So on this date in you know 1969, this came out, and so it becomes a sort of almost. Uh, uh, daily calendar of comic book history. And do either of you guys have a personal website or Twitter account or Facebook account you want people to be aware of? 
Uh, Keith is probably smiling because I have a number of answers to that. Um, I am at Jason Sachs with a K on Twitter. I'm also the publisher of um, the website where Keith and I actually first uh, got together, comicsbulletin.com. We publish comics, news interviews, and reviews um, about 25 to 30 pieces a week, some historical, some modern, some alt comics, some pop comics. Um, we have a very diverse staff and a very diverse uh, type of material that we cover, and um, it's been a wonderful project with some amazing people, including Keith, who have been involved over the years. Keith, anything to add to that? I, 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 I can't. Jason took all, you know, Jason took up all the, the websites. I used to, I'm no. sucking the air out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, uh, <laughs> Jason... Jason Sachs and Keith Dallas. Uh, it was a great conversation. I love the book. I hope people will buy multiple copies, p- put money in your in your pocket, and uh, thank you both so much for doing the book and for joining us today on Mr. Media. Thanks so much, Bob. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Hi, this is Buzz Burbank in the Buzz Burbank Newsroom, preparing for you another Buzz Burbank News and Comment. Do you like good stories? Boy, I sure do. I turn over a lot of stones each day to make sure I don't miss the best ones. Sure, some make me angry, and some make me sad, and some make me laugh, and isn't that what makes us human? I'm proud of the fact that I pack more news into my 10 or 15 minutes a day than the evening news does in a half hour. It's a free podcast at buzzburbank.com, or you can subscribe free at iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or get it on any RSS device. It's like a newspaper for your head. It's Buzz Burbank News and Comment, another Realm Network presentation. Weekday mornings right here on the Realm Network. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to the George and Tony Entertainment Show. Prepare for awesome mediocrity. We're the Cousin Oliver of the Realm Network. I'm George. And I'm Tony. And we're a weekly family-friendly podcast about pop culture. From our point of view. At RealmNetwork.com, the George and Tony Entertainment Show. From the Realm Network. It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Hi, this is Mark. And this is Lowell. And if you're fans of Don and Mike, you may know who we are. Our number one interns. You've met them on the show. They're the guys that ate all the junk. And they were outside with each other holding hands with a sign that said that they loved each other wearing the dunce caps. What you may not know is that we started out as fans back in their WAVA days. Hi, Don and Mike. It's Mark and Lowell. Oh, yeah. These are, these are two guys that uh, we once actually called them our protégés, didn't we? And now we have our own show, so we want you to give it a shot. And just check us out at the Realm Network, realmnetwork.com, or you can go to markandlowell.com. The system is futile. It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Every Tuesday and Thursday evenings right here on the Realm Network. And catch the Poor Premium Show Friday nights.